Great. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And um, I'll just do a little quick intro for you and then pass over to our guests. So today we've got Jackie and Dawn speaking to us, um, who will be discussing the Marine Education and Research Society's Ocean Voices Education Campaign. Um, so Jackie is a humpback whale researcher and Dawn is an artist. You might actually recognise some of her drawings um, in our office. So um, I'll pass over to you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Olivia. And on we go. We have the joy of talking to you about, well, the animals who need a quieter ocean. And we're going to start true to our topic of ocean voices by the first sound that you'll hear in the presentation being one of the voices here off the coast of northern Vancouver Island, British Columbia, Canada. So I think that makes clear what we're going to be talking about and what the intent of our project is and why we have uh, banded together with artist Don Dudek. So who are the two voices that you will be hearing today that are not marine mammals? I'm close. I'm aiming at being a marine <laughs> mammal, both in terms of, thanks for laughing, Don. Yeah, in terms of blubber acquired and how often I am either uh, on the ocean or in it. Um, I have the incredible privilege of being up here in the territory of the Kwakla speaking people. Uh, I am more than 7,600 kilometers away from you right now and will be gripping onto coffee regularly because it's just after 8 a.m. in the morning. Uh, I am an escaped biology teacher who spent a lot of time in the Netherlands. And then upon realizing uh, when I was the deputy head of the International School of Rotterdam that I was talking about nature as if it were somewhere else, that I came back to British Columbia, uh, I was born here, and that all I wanted was to learn from nature and make it count. I could never have foreseen that that would lead to being a humpback whale researcher. Initially, it was education in other forms, uh, my deciding as well to become a diver, an underwater photographer to try to speak for why there's whales here in terms of the density of life and those in Britain would understand this so well. There's a bias to warm water being where there's more life because it's easier to see. But if you can see it more easily, you don't have the planktonic soup to support everything. So that's a big package of what brought me back to British Columbia. I've been here for 25 years now and there's one very small part of the planet where I know individual fish up to individual humpback whales. The origin story of our organization is that humpbacks came back from the brink. They We only stopped whaling them in 1967. So that's who I am. And I go by the marine detective as well, which hopefully suggests the right humility in that I'm trying to learn from the ocean and make that count. And then the other human voice in this presentation, dear Dawn. Hi, I'm uh, Dawn Dudek and I'm um, a visual artist and I volunteer for MERS and help them with their um, communication and messaging. And um, I first became involved actually with Blue Marine Foundation in 2019 through um, the uh, the Blue Edition exhibition at um, Andre Hamilton Studio in London curated by Nico Koch. And, uh, and then after I started volunteering with MERS, some of my animations were used um, in the Blue Minds exhibition. So um, this is a, a relatively recent project, Ocean Voices. And um, I'm also um, developing an animated short film called Ocean and Voces, which is an expanded version of this, which I'll talk about a, a little bit um, later. You can play the little seal animation, Jackie, if you want. <laughs> A 
brilliant introduction to who you are and what motivates you, Don. Uh, Don is the catalyst uh, to your organization. A little bit more background about who we are as the Marine Education and Research Society, which will help frame what we're trying to do and why uh, with this project around Ocean Voices. So we are an organization that we are both researchers and educators. So the research that we do, be it on the scars that indicate how often humpbacks are getting entangled, yeah, or on impacts of uh, vessel traffic, that feeds directly into our education efforts. The third pillar that we operate on is that we also respond to entangled whales, dead whales, working coordinate in coordination with Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Um, I could go on in explaining what our um, what our evolution is as an organization. This is only the one graph I show you. I promise some of you might be disappointed in that, but it does show what happened in terms of what we never saw coming and the gap that we're trying to close. So humpbacks were whaled. We never used to see them. A group of friends then saw the humpback starting to come back and it simply wasn't acceptable not to know who they were. Yeah, just to go, oh, look, it's a humpback. We wanted to know who they were. Would they come back? What? When was their age at their first calving and so forth? When we got really serious about this in the entire year in the area indicated here in uh, yellow, we only had seven humpbacks in the entire year. It is now over 100 in the same year. So there is this growth in the population post whaling, but it is also the case that the whales are shifting from somewhere else. Um, a paper was just researched yesterday that we were part, sorry, published yesterday that we were part of that also indicates what the shift and decline might be because of warming oceans as well. So since then, we're trying to close this gap and who are they? We're the coordinators of the entire uh, effort on our coast. Um, for those who are cataloging humpbacks. And the reality is, as you have more humpbacks near the coast, you have this very fortunate second chance to have a large whale back. But there is this unknowing about the whales in that in the absence of big whales along the coast of British Columbia, it seems that boaters have come to equate whale with orca. And as the big dolphins they are, they behave so very, very differently. Our work now has become to try to educate on the risk of entanglement, on the risk of vessel strike. And of course, there's also very real human safety risks associated with that. So as educators, a very big part of our work is then to try to compel boater safety, but also compliance to the rules. And it's become about both the safety of the marine mammals, but also the safety of people. And we are developing an online course that addresses both of these, because in terms of how our government operates in Canada, you'd never get the meeting in a government course of the animal safety and conservation piece and the boater safety piece. And what we're doing with the work with Dawn will feed into that online resource. Showing you a ridiculous photo here of me and my beloved colleague. What the heck is this about? I could go on more about what we're trying to do and how ocean noise fits into that and how collision and, of course, ocean noise are very much intertwined with one another. But I'm speaking to people in London right now, or at least in England. So I'm going to share with you that in our evolution, what we also never saw coming is that this guy, Sir Somebody <laughs> or Other, has... Actually, we were involved with Planet Earth 3 in episode 7, the human episode, and that the importance of whales was addressed within that. And mind-blowing to us is to have then filmed with the BBC over two years. And I'm not going to show you the section in the episode 7, but I will dedicate three minutes here to how the BBC has helped us, the Natural History Unit, in putting together this web resource that in part addresses ocean noise. So not narrated by Sir David, the voice of God, but here you go as in part of what then is going to feed into the Ocean Voices campaign.
it used to be such a rarity that we even saw one in this area where they belonged. They were whaled out of this area. I can remember seeing the first two together and that it brought me to tears because it was such um, so moving to think that they might be making a comeback uh, despite everything that we had done to them. For humpbacks, it is a rare good news story where we humans get a second chance with giants. We whaled them in British Columbia up till 1967. We didn't push them over the brink. In 2003, in the whole year, we identified seven individual humpbacks, and now it's up to 106 in the same area. We're only just discovering how important whales are for the health of the whole ecosystem. Their feces fertilizes the water and boosts the food web from the bottom up. There is the realization that there's still many ways to kill a whale. The threats that humpbacks are facing are certainly a collision, entanglement, those are very direct uh, impacts to them, and also impacts of noise. There's one issue that we can tackle right now. We have such great concern about collision between boats and humpbacks. And that is everything from recreational boats to sailboats to the large vessel traffic that we literally fuel with our consumerism. The risk is incredibly significant. It is uh, such a huge part of our work to try to reach boaters for the sake of their own safety and that of the whales. And yet the average boater doesn't realize that the whales are not traveling in a straight line. They don't realize that the humpback so often and other baleen whales don't know where vessels are. They don't have the echolocation that toothed whales have. They can be resting right below the surface. They can suddenly become acrobatic. is truly incredibly problematic. There are examples of whales I know that have died as a result of collision with boats. There are those like Slash who bear the scarring of a propeller down her back. We even have a calf from this year who is less than a year old and has already been hit by a boat. That they survive is remarkable and of course what we can't capture is how many die and sink to the bottom of the ocean. The solution is education. The solution is education. The solution is education over laws, over enforcement. We believe it is. They, laws and enforcement are required as well, but most people would want to do the right thing. And I think your organization too is directed in this regard is where if you can increase understanding of why there's laws, you could compel compliance to those laws. You could create voter motivation for things like slow down zone, zones and avoidance zones, sanctuaries. So the limitations of the laws will our vast coastline for starters, if somebody wants to do the wrong thing, and violate the laws around distance, for example, they're going to do the wrong thing. There's also uh, very complicated laws that change depending on what area you're in or what species or what behavior 
we don't have a system here of ticketing. So it isn't like you were too close, here you go. Yeah, this is the way that you're adding to the stresses of this species. It's that everything has to go to court. So extremely limited resources. So we're aiming at changing boater behavior, creating a culture of boaters who do the right thing, consumer behavior and how that impacts the amount of noise and risk of collision. And of course, in a world where things can switch very quickly, and I know to whom I'm speaking, in terms of political will, that we have voters uh, hopefully on board as well. So there are laws here just very quickly. Um, we had them significantly amended where there, there are things specified like don't swim with, don't touch, don't feed. And then included in that is minimum avoidance distances. But you can see here, yeah, there's one distance for orca, killer whales. Then another distance, oh, but wait, if they're resting or if they have calves and the average boater does not know that, yeah, it's a different distance again. On top of that, because we have one population of endangered orca in one zone around our very large uh, island to the south, it becomes 400 meters for orca. So I think this already, for the purposes of this presentation, gives you insight into, wait a minute, even if I were a boater trying to do the right thing, this is made complicated for me. Measures to also try to uh, help the recovery of this endangered population of orca also does include slowdown zones and uh, an area as well uh, that is a no-go zone, two very small areas that are no-go zone for recreational vessels. But there are limitations in how useful that is, and unfortunately it's directed at one species not looking at marine mammals holistically. So the laws vary depending on where you are, the behavior of the animals, the species, so not ideal. By compelling positive change, specifically what we're trying to do is what if people understood why there are these laws? Why are these animals in trouble? What have we done to them in the past? And why and what are the things that still impact them? Because there's still many ways to kill a whale. In terms of boaters, as referenced already, we wish to create a culture of compliance so that by understanding the impacts of noise and the stresses of just vessel proximity, they will do things like increase the distance, like err on the side of uh, caution. They will reduce speed because most often when you reduce speed, you are reducing the amount of noise in the ocean. They would decrease their time spent around marine mammals. There would be the will, because we also don't have licensing for whale watching boats here, where a critical public yeah, would then also perceive that there are too many boats around a group of marine mammals. Engine maintenance, my goodness, if we actually cared yeah, and were made to listen to the noise we're injecting into the ocean, yeah, we would change as well. So in this culture of boaters, uh, we already were working in that direction in this area is where the whale warning flag was born and is now used throughout British Columbia and into Washington state. And what is done is that when there are whales around, the flag goes up and that that signals that there has to be increased vigilance and decreased speed. But a byproduct of this flag is that people are, boaters are identifying as the good guys. And that we ask them as well, like if you're going to use this flag, you've got to use it properly. But you also need to know the laws, report violations, be on the lookout for when the animals are in trouble. And as mentioned, this is all feeding into a whale safe boating course. From consumers, you're literally fueling large vessel traffic. <laughs> so understanding that where things are coming from and that also that if you are also fueling tanker traffic, there are things you can do around that. Yeah, if not for the well-being of our own kind, how about we do it to reduce the risk of collision? For example, we have humpbacks that we know are sh uh, sleeping right in the shipping lanes off our coast. And then also consumers can greatly help in changing the perceptions around wildlife viewing. What we hope for is that the shift goes to how wild was the encounter? Did it happen as if you weren't there rather than how close? And then from a voter perspective, what you would anticipate, we need the support for slowdown zones, for sanctuary zones, for the technologies to reduce noise, for alternative fuels where you don't have the same number of tankers, regulations for engine noise and regulations for coastal developments and resource extraction. And I think we all understand how low that that last term is. 
So using education to compel compliance, we knew as educators that this would be a powerful tool. Uh, history, my history is in whale watching in the time that I first came back to British Columbia and oh, the power of when we would shut off the engines, just sit there and throw in a hydrophone and that independent of language barriers on the vessels we worked on, you would see people as they got to hear the orca, yeah, that they realized that there was an entire world of sound, that the animals are living in a world of sound. So as an example of that, then there is this simple little video um, and the response we get to that is that people like I didn't know, yeah, they had forgotten yeah, what I think every child who has their head in a bathtub, yeah, it realizes that sound is magnified. And the very simple things like here, a little music box. Yeah, the sound you hear in air, put it down on a solid. Oh, wow, it's so much louder. Yes. And the ocean is in between where the molecules are closer together. So here's that example. So we've got the hydrophone in the water. There's a little speaker right here. It's relatively quiet in the ocean. There's a little boat in the distance that has just slowed down. It's still got its engine on. But as it speeds up again, you'll notice even at that distance with a relatively small boat, just what a difference it makes to how much sound is in the ocean. So we can increase awareness of how much noise we're making under the ocean, then we have to couple to that to how is it disturbing? Well, marine mammals, again, live in a world of sound for everything to do with communication to targeting out through echolocation, whether it is a Chinook salmon over a sockeye salmon. It has to do with socializing, even recognizing degree of relatedness to avoid being eaten, yet to know where your prey is. Entirely a world of sound. So now I want to switch then to some examples of this, the ocean voices of our big marine mammal neighbors here uh, as examples then, and the far more compelling thing than my voice in why you would want it to be a quieter ocean. So here very quickly off the coast of British Columbia, there are four different populations of orca that do not mate with one another. Yeah, the way that it works with orca globally is the biggest helpful concept is that they don't mate with one another because they have to retain the cultures that work for the way that they feed within the ecosystem. So for example, then we have two populations of inshore fish eating orca. I won't go into the detail of why resident is erroneous. Yeah, but they are incredibly reliant on Chinook salmon. Yeah, the biggest, the fattiest salmon. There is then a population of mammal eating killer whales. They are called Biggs killer whales. And yes, they are bigger, but that's not how they got their name. That's for a name for a researcher. And you can imagine that along the coast, your easiest snack is going to be harbor seals. But you can't go through the ocean making a lot of sound because your prey is going to get the heck out. Yeah, so the, as an indicator of how the culture has to be very different. And then a species that is more often out in the open ocean or a population that's more often out in the ocean uh, are the offshores and their diet includes sharks. So four different populations, they don't mate with one another, they have different languages. But at the level of then one population, the northern resident orca, the ones that are most often in the area where I am right now and where we are based as the Marine Education Research Society, the culture that you are afforded being on fish is very different than if you were feeding on marine mammals. So if you're feeding on fish, fish have really bad hearing. So you can afford to go through the ocean, click, 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 yeah, over here, share food, yeah, and that they're calling to one another. In fact, the way that they organize themselves is that every family sounds different. So they are unified by sound. 
And there is no coming into the family other than being born into it. And there is no leaving the family unless you die. They are always together. You never get mummy, daddy and baby together. So unified by sound and that they can even judge degree of relatedness by sound. So here are the examples of this at the level of family or matriline, they sound different. It's a dark ocean. They have excellent eyesight, but the reason you need sound in a dark ocean, yeah, either at depth or because of the thickness of plankton, yeah, is because your eyes often can't see as far as you need to. So here are sounds being made by one of the dialect groups within this population. And the way that they're making sound, as is the case with all toothed cetaceans, is that they're recycling air under their blowhole. You're going to hear their calls that make them distinct. You're also going to hear the clicking of echolocation that indeed allows them to discern yeah, how they navigate, but also even discern one species of salmon over the other. Here you have the ocean voice of members of the A clan of northern residents. There's the clicking of echolocation or biosonar. So the way this works is that, of course, the orca can recognize one another, but even a distance here, they can determine degree of relatedness. And to emphasize this, the way it works then is if you sound exactly the same as an orca, you're members of the same family, you do not mate with one another. If you sound really different, you don't mate with one another because then you're a different kind of orca with a different kind of culture. But if you sound a little bit different, and this is tragic, <laughs> I realize, it is sexy, yeah? But nobody leaves the families to mate. The families come together and separate, and the calf learns the dialect of their lineage. So here's an example. A-clan finds G-clan super sexy. <laughs> and the reason why is because they sound really different. And for the rest of your life, you'll be able to recognize this other grouping of northern resident orca because they've one very distinct call, like a donkey. You'll recognize it here. And just to show how very different their vocal range is, here are members of the third dialect group, and some of their calls are so low frequency, they almost sound like snorting pigs. So yeah, we hope people don't want to disrupt all of that that's going on. What if you were a mammal eating killer whale? Well, look at this little seal's face. Yeah, it makes complete sense that the, these orca are not gonna go around making a lot of sound because it would be like ringing the dinner bell. Like, oh no, the last time I heard that sound, Bob died. Yeah, not a good idea. <laughs> They've got to, thanks, Don. They've got to be quieter <laughs> if they're hungry. Yeah, so things like in this epic, epic photo that you see here, this is a mammal eating orca coming up underneath a doll's porpoise. The doll's porpoises can go 55 kilometers per hour. Yeah, the, the acoustics of porpoises have actually evolved to be outside of the hearing range of orca. So the big killer whales, the mammal eaters, have to actually hear just the sound of the movement of their prey. So ocean noise is masking their ability to find their food. Yeah, so they all have one language, and here's an example of that. So the porpoises have evolved to have their sound outside the hearing range. Dolphins have not. So Pacific white-sided dolphins are common on our coast, and oh boy, can they make a whole heck of a lot of noise. Just the amount of splashing when they're together in big groups like this, they can be in the thousands, but they also are extraordinarily vocal and are using echolocation. Why make all that sound? Well, it's got to be 
an important enough reason that it outweighs the chance of being eaten by a mammal eating orca. And also, of course, if you're in a big group like this, make a lot of sound because maybe somebody else will get eaten. Yeah, that the odds are in your favor. But here is what Pacific white sided dolphins sound like. So in their case, yeah, the sound is important for all the communication, coordination, yeah, the working together as they do in so many ways, but also that they could hear the prey, their predators coming. Pacific Harbor Seal's favorite snack, easiest snack of mammal eating orca. If you're going to make sound, it better be worth it as well. So a relatively recent discovery is that harbor seals, rather than the likes of sea lions that are establishing territory on land, the males are establishing territory in the ocean. And the reason I'm laughing is I'm reflecting on, I, I got an email from somebody, if you call yourself the marine detective, you're going to get questions like this about, I hear a sound under my sailboat. Yeah, I've had a hydrophone in the water. What is it? Is it a monster? This was actually somebody who was afraid. And what it was is a male harbor seal establishing territory during mating season. But Here's the sound so that you can understand why this would be unsettling. <laughs> so more ambassadors of the sound in the ocean, minke whales. We actually also study minke whales as individuals. And what is remarkable is that they, in warm water areas, have an extraordinary sound that is has been called the Star Wars call. They do not, we've done the research, they do not make the, that call in this area. So, understandably, this is likely to be because they don't want to be eaten by mammal-eating killer whales. You are not going to make this call that is then very likely associated with mating behavior which is happening within warm waters. So here is the astounding Star Wars call of minke whales. <laughs> astounding, indeed. Gray whales, we get here people disparaging gray whales. They look like floating rocks. Yeah, floating rocks. They're in terrible trouble, some of the members of this population, whereby we should care. And that, of course, noise is one of the stresses that builds on them. But if you get to hear a gray whale, they have this astounding vocal repertoire. But here is my favorite call and what appears to work really well for the purposes of education. If you know the sounds they're making and how little we even know around so many of these vocalizations, maybe you're compelled to care a little bit more. So here is the bongo call of a gray whale. Your invertebrates in the background making sound. It's not about the marine mammals, John. You know this. Yeah. yeah. The way that the baleen whales are making sound, by the way, is from their throat area, from the larynx. So then the species that we actually study as an ambassador for the importance of reducing ocean noise, pointing out a uh, please that not all humpbacks feed in the same way. We so often get, oh yeah, they bubble net feed, they work together, release bubbles from their blowhole. Yeah, in areas like where I am right now, there is so much currents that were you to try to use expanding bubbles as a net, they'd get blasted away. So we have all these remarkable other strategies and humpbacks, they're of course not just randomly going around uh, our coast, they're coming back to specific areas where they know how to feed with different strategies. They know the tides, they know what prey is there. But the famed group bubble net feeding does involve vocals. So boring infographic here, and then I'll play the video. So the way that it works is that one of the whales in a team, and it's the same team coming back year upon year, and this happens from the northern end of our island all the way up into Alaska. Back they come from the breeding grounds, and one of the animals is a caller. Woo -woo! Making a call that was believed to be about coordinating this behavior. Yeah that it serves like a referee's whistle. 
but so remarkable is that there is now the theory that it is also about concentrating the herring, the prey, because that frequency is making the swim bladder vibrate. They become more agitated and ball up even more. And research that supports this is that there are orca in Norway that when they feed on herring, they're making the same frequency call. At any rate, bubble net feeding, how does it work? There's a collar, pretty clear what the herders are doing, go around the fish yeah, as a way to keep them together. One of the whales releases then from their blowhole bubbles that expand as they go up. And then it's a really good idea to all have your own position in the nets so you don't ram heads on the way up. This is a video showing that behavior. Uh, you'll also have empathy for our work to try to reduce collision because you will notice there are no signs at the surface with this feeding behavior of whales being right below the surface. We have a hydrophone in the water. We had the hydrophone in the water for already about three minutes. You'll hear the calls. You'll see some animals skidding back and forth at the surface. Those are dolls porpoises. But here you have the incredible importance of acoustics to the humpbacks who group bubble net feed. I anticipate you gasped at that. Yeah, so hour upon hour upon hour, these calls are being made in order to feed. Other importance of vocals to humpbacks, but also actually to all marine mammals, is that they're going to be contact calls. And that those sounds, if you are on the menu of mammal eating killer whales, are going to be very, very quiet in order not to alert your predator to your presence. So here's an example then with humpback whales. And then there's song. And of course, we're gonna play humpback whale song. It's only the males who sing. Females also vocalize for the reasons, some of the reasons that we've already made clear with feeding, contact calls with calves, chatting to other humpbacks. But the male song, I think, made us way better humans uh, in realizing that this is happening and caring about the animals. Of course, it's incredibly compelling from an education conservation standpoint. All the males in one breeding area are singing the same song. If the song changes, they all adopt a change. Why sing? We humans still don't know. It's got to do with mating, even though they do sing in cold water, like our area as well. And the theory is that that is either a display to the females and or about establishing acoustic territory. But here you have one humpback we know really, really well, Anukshuk. Um, yeah, singing his heart out in cold water. And again, no signs at the surface that you've got a humpback singing right below the surface. And then very new research as well is that it's been found that the voice box of baleen whales can't operate in the same way at depth so that they vocalize up near the surface. And of course, that's where the most 
yeah, where the most shipping noise is. So the impacts then, so hoping to compel compliance through caring that there is all this purpose to why marine mammals and other animals are vocalizing in the ocean. Mm -hmm. And in the extreme, it can actually cause physical damage. So for example, low frequency sonar associated with oil and gas exploration is actually a physical sound that can cause rupturing. But then what are the impacts to on a, on a on a lesser level, maybe it depends on everything uh, from like how loud was the sound that you can have suddenly acute damage or that there's just like many of us at my age uh, are living testament to that you've just been exposed to the same sound over and over again and it's having damage in that regard. What population and what other things are they already experiencing that enhances and amplifies those stresses and then what are they doing? For example, here you have a resting line of orca. It's one of the most beautiful things one could hope to see, but is being seen less and less during daylight hours, is that the orca all group up and have these synchronous dives, and they're shutting off half their brain to rest and then the other. And yeah, if you've got ocean noise, you've got a greater chance of disrupting that behavior. So I want to make the point too, though, it's not just about the noise, even just the presence of vessels. Often you have kayakers or other paddle propelled craft thinking that they're more benign. There's research supporting that even just the presence of any vessel can disrupt behavior. You can certainly imagine how it disrupt, like in this case, it was a mammal eating killer whale trying to eat a sea lion and these paddlers came right up to it. I would never do that. Yeah, but if they are, you've got animals that are trying to nurse, yeah, rest, et cetera. So it's adding to the stress. And then an example then to, to so important to realize as well, and with you as an audience, I'm using the big difficult words of cumulative and synergistic, but it isn't just, for example, this one boat going by these orca just once. It is boat after boat after boat but also it is layering on top of the other stresses they're experiencing. So for example, with those endangered population of orca, what research supports is going on with them is that if you don't have enough Chinook salmon, you are burning up your fat. And that releases human-made chemicals, both historic and new ones, that then impact the ability to reproduce and to fight off disease. And then the presence and noise, presence of vessels and noise from vessels is ramping up the stresses and impacts of those two other. So those are the realities of how things interact, well, how the animals are using sound. You get where people, uh, in trying to see a silver lining of, for example, the COVID-19 epidemic, is you'll have people say, yeah, but we were quiet then, weren't we? And the whales were happier. Were we quieter? Most of us got online and shopped for things from far away. But there was one area where there was some insight resulting from a quieter ocean, and that was up in Glacier Bay in Alaska. They have been recording the vocals of humpbacks for a very long time. With COVID-19, there were no cruise ships coming up to that area and the ocean was much quieter, three times quieter. And what they found is that the humpback whale calling changed, but we don't know what that change means. There is another time that we humans went quiet in the ocean, and that is associated with 9-11. And there's actually more insight gained from that time. So after the terrorist attacks of 9-11 back in 2001, for security reasons, no shipping allowed. And there were two studies going on on the east coast of Canada, one looking at noise levels, and there was a researcher already looking at, with coincidence, at the stress hormones in endangered North Atlantic right whales. When those two things were brought together, when the ocean went quiet, be it ever so briefly, it was seen that when the noise level went down, the levels of stress hormones within the whale's poo also went down. And that the this is evidence for the exposure to shipping noise being associated with chronic stress in whales. And in this case, 
uh, the rarest of the rare, a very endangered whale species. So that's enough of the science and educators voice. We're science and art. So dear Dawn, it's over to you. I can only say you're such a difficult person to follow. <laughs> like, uh, I'm sure everyone agrees what an um, amazing presentation that was, Jackie. I'm always, always inspired. And uh, that's exactly the reason um, why I do what I do. Um, and I'm so passionate about making work that um, can help communicate issues around ocean conservation. Um, when I took your uh, the MERS naturalist course, uh, one of the things that stood out to me was that you protect what you love. And when I make my work and I'm passionate about what I do, um, I felt like um, hopefully by sharing that, that passion that um, people and viewers would be able to um, feel something and motivate, be motivated to change or to take action or learn more or just share um share some of what they've they've learned like hopefully what we will do today um so uh i guess i i just think that that's the beauty of artists and and scientists combining to be able to find different ways to communicate um and i mean i was i was just sort of so moved by um working with you that i actually physically moved myself to Vancouver Island and to Campbell River to immerse myself in this incredible environment and to learn from you. And uh, yeah, I just I just can't get enough and I wanna continue this work. And um, so these two animations that you're seeing today are also part of a, a bigger project that I'm working on with um, Nico. And um, it's, it's basically an animated short film. So a 10 minute version um, based around the impact of noise and not only how uh, this noise can impact marine mammals, but also invertebrates and how it can affect the whole um, food web. So the the idea is, is and the look and feel is, is very similar, but I just, we're going to develop more of a soundscape and um, we're going to have some spoken poetry so I'm, I'm working on that now and, uh, you know, as always, trying to find funding and sponsorship and just slowly work on that as well as other projects. But, um, yeah, so that's, that's a little bit about me. Thank you so much, Dawn. We started with one of Dawn's animations. We're going to end with one of Dawn's an animations. These will feed into our online boater course. We've not put them out into the world widely yet. But as we hope, we've made really clear that the intent is to use the ocean voices in order to compel compliance and for us to be better humans. So leaving it now to the final voice of some of the fish eating orca, and you'll recognize which group this is. Whales live in a world of underwater sound. They depend on sound to communicate, to find food, to stay in contact, to navigate, to socialize, to choose me. Sound is magnified in water. Boat by boat, we add to the whale's crest. So we hope that this compels you to help share the messaging. I can follow up with an email uh, in both cases with the animations. The sound is coming from Orca Lab in our area, where you can listen live to humpback singing, for example, or the orca going by. So please uh, follow us yeah, on social media. If you are on social media, help expand the reach of the animations and other messaging that you support as well. Ideally, you'd sign up for our newsletter and then it won't surprise you that we have things like whale sponsorships and the sale, uh, the sale of sustainable goods and the like. But please, let's stay connected for the whales. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, it's so nice to hear those sounds and those voices. Um, does anyone have? Oh, yeah, there's a few people with questions already. 
um, <laughs> happen. Sorry, this is actually revealing how bad at using my laptop I am. I was just meaning to do the clapping sign. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that app. Um, we will take it. <laughs> yeah. I just want to echo what um, Olivia just said. That was so fascinating. And that, yeah, I loved, loved, loved all the recordings. And yeah, it's so obvious how passionate you are about it. So yeah, thanks for taking the time to talk to us about it. It was amazing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Gail, do you have a question? I did. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you. That was so interesting from so many different angles. Um, one thing that really kind of leapt out to me is the idea that it's not just disturbance, but it can even have kind of possible evolutionary effects. Um, it was really interesting to hear about whales differentiating different species and different groups um, through sound. Um, I've done a little bit of work on seabirds and and how they differentiate between each other with their bill colour and their foot colour and, and the incidence of hybridisation. Do you have examples of, of different species interbreeding with each other in the area that you're working? Is there any evidence of that? Yes, uh, absolutely. So both um, Dulls Porpoise and Harbour Porpoise uh, they hybridize and are actually fertile. Um, and also in cetaceans, hybridization is not rare. Uh, so fin whales and blue whales, the two biggest animals that ever lived on the planet, for example. Uh, and But it's believed to be a very small percentage where it isn't having population level impacts. Uh, and in fact, there is this, some of you may have, yeah, this information went viral. There's the 52 Hertz whale. Yeah, Hertz as an H E R T Z, uh, where it's like the loneliest whale. Yeah, some of you are nodding, right? So there's this whole like, oh my God, there's one single whale out there making this one call that nobody else is making. Um, it's now believed that that might be the sound that hybrids make. Uh, it could also be that there, so it's not just the loneliest whale. And why can we humans not care about populations rather than just individuals? But at any rate, uh, it could also be that this is a call that is. Uh, necessary because of impacts of ocean noise. So that research hasn't been solidified, but that may be a hybrid, that uh, hybrid bluefin whale. That's super interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Gail. Uh, Marina. Hi, yes. Thank you so much, Jackie and Dawn. That was incredibly moving and inspiring. I think hearing the sound, as you say, must be so emotive from an educational aspect because it just completely hit the heartstrings um and also incidentally my grandmother lived on vancouver island so um it was very lovely to hear about it and see the space and i just hope that boaters listen up and that things can be changed and thank you for for all the work you do thank you so much rena thank you all for making it feel so worthwhile like part of the what is it the the privilege of being here and learning in the way that we are is this is an area that's still relatively quiet sometimes right even in southern British Columbia there's so much boat traffic that the examples of the the vocals that we played for you can't be gained from those areas so all along our coast now is like you know we we have the government perspective that we can have endangered marine mammals but tankers too so there is this urgency around setting up a network of hydrophones that are all calibrated the same way to capture the impacts of noise and then trying of course to have the baseline data like how do you for animals that spend so much of their time below the surface like figure out what kind of behavioral impacts there are to that right but yeah it's it has to be that people the science is never going to speak in the same way that people just hearing those sounds and whatever it is that connects us and under that that gut understanding of these are families communicating with one another. That's a mum and baby. Yeah. Oh, no, that porpoise is going to get eaten. There's so much we can do with regards to consumer voter behavior and how we operate as voters as well. Yeah, it's it's not difficult to make engines quieter. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Oh, yeah, Aaliyah. 
Yeah, thank you so much. What an inspiring, I'm mirroring everyone else, but I genuinely, that was such an inspiring and moving um, presentation. And I feel like just getting those sounds to the general public and getting those stories from under the surface I thought those shots especially where there's you can't see anything or it was yeah. and you know just <laughs> meters away they're forming a synchronized bubble and working collaboratively and there's so much to be said um and I just I think there's so much fascinating research I'm just curious from like a very academic perspective there's still questions that people are really looking to answer what is the most upcoming research or oh God. What, is, like, what are the angles that are the wish to have but are still in development just on acoustics or just generally I think in that specific region with with the whales um yeah, yeah. that you're looking so, at so so unfortunately in like that gap I referenced right like we're trying to close the gap uh and so so much of our work is directed at threat mitigation while, for example, nobody on Earth knows why humpback males sing. Nobody on Earth knows how baleen whales find their food. You know, could we, I'm, I'm okay living in the space of not knowing because I think having humility is so incredibly important in how we interact with the natural world, right? We don't get to know it all. We don't, in, ingenuity is not the solution for everything. But our work, instead of those big questions like, like the associations between animals and all that kind of thing, it is all drowned out by the need for proving conservation. In our case, the humpbacks in British Columbia are recognized as one population with a very low level of protection. As soon as they cross the border, they're recognized as three populations and, re and two of which are like at, at risk. The way that funding flows, which I know is the case for you as well, is that it is with those animals recognized as being at risk. So part of our world and where we're trying to like fund it ourselves and close the gap is things like these can't be perceived as one population. They're going to different places to mate. How does that make one population? Or that we have to because the way that humpbacks and, and other baleen whales work, they don't associate in families like the orca do, where absence of an individual not in their family equals dead. So we have to try to like give some sort of indicator of how extreme the threat of entanglement is because we humans also love like, oh, look, the human saved the, the whale. Yeah, that's the solution. No, it's not. At least 50% of the humpbacks have scarring from entanglements on our vast coastline. I assure you, we are not finding, yeah, or coastline, even like the expansive ocean that goes beyond the coast. So, so much, so many of the questions are about proving the need to stop the threat at the source. So in our case, it is the SCAR studies instead of things that are directed at bigger picture, like these astounding uh, feeding strategies, which is again, thank God we're the Marine Education and Research Society because there's a new feeding strategy here. It's what the, why a BBC came to us where the humpbacks, when there isn't a dense concentration of herring, will just sit there with their mouths open at the surface. If you remember that one photo, we're actually looking up at the palate of the humpback. And then they'll sit there as long as there's birds that are chasing the herring, which will then hide in the mouth of the humpback. So they're using less energy to get their food than they would by other strategies. Why I'm saying, thank God, we're the Marine Education Research Society, were we only researchers, that would be like, there is this fabulous feeding behavior, publish research, feed into the machine. And this is like, no, you should care more for humpbacks because look at how wickedly cool they are. We do not know if they do this because there's less herring or not. It is spreading through the population. It's gone from two whales. The two whales' names are Conger and Moonstar. And now there's more than 30 that do it which has way more potential for change than just publishing because you are speaking about whales as individuals. And I think there's ample evidence that when we care about animals as individuals, generally we're better humans. They're astounding indicators of environmental health, but also barometers for human values. Thank you so much. Um, any other questions? Thank you so much for taking the time. It feels very worthwhile. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Jackie, and thank you, Dawn, as well. Thank you. And uh, yeah, we'll Take keep care. in touch with you. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. much. Thank, thank you so much. Bye. 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 Bye.